Welcome everyone. Um, as we're waiting for the slides, my name is Leslie Orloff. I wanna welcome you all here today. I direct the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project at American University, Washington College of Law. And we are here, um, this webinar is sponsored by the State Justice Institute. Um, the views you'll hear today are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the position of the State Justice Institute. Um, and that we are particularly um, happy for you to join us today. And for those of you, next slide please, who are judges, um, we encourage you to join us. This is an event planned by the National Judicial Network, which is made up of judges from throughout the country, um, mostly state court judges um, who, and the National Judicial Network uh, judges and judicial officers, tribal judges, magistrates, commissioners, et cetera, are uh, welcome to join. Um, and it's an opportunity to engage in discussions with other judges to get the latest information on um, issues around human trafficking or immigrant victims in the courts. Um, there's peer-to-peer -peer sessions um, and an opportunity to get technical assistance and have access to training materials. There's gonna be a link in the chat for where judges can sign up. And it, whether if you're judge or courts, uh, court staff and working with judges, um, any help you could provide us in advertising the Judicial Network, we'd greatly appreciate it. And um, hope that for those of you that are judges or who work with judges in your communities, please share the information with them um, about joining us in the National Judicial Network. To, next slide, please. To date, we have 145 uh, judicial members um, from around the country. Some are commissioners, include some retired judges, um, state court judges, um, et cetera. And next slide. And uh, the last thing I wanted to announce is that there's going to be uh, materials available to you together with the recording of this webinar It'll be available at this link. We'll email it to you following the presentation um, so you can get all the rich set of materials provided by the speakers in addition to the webinar today. Um, and at the end, we have a, um, an evaluation that we hope that you will complete to give us feedback on this um, training so that we can um, get, a, get back to the speakers and, and uh, offer similar trainings in the future. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over um, to Justice Ann McKeague um, to introduce the speakers and start off this great presentation. Welcome, Judge and Seneca. Miigwech, uh, bonjour. Anine, everyone. My name is Ann McKeague. That is my uh, Christian name. My native name is Awanikwe, which means missed woman. And I was given that name a few years ago, actually by one of our elders and it means the uh, the mist that overlays the white earth nation in the early mornings as a protector. So I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Um, I am a, an associate justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. I have been on the Supreme Court for since 2016. Prior to that, I served as a district court judge in Hennepin County, Minnesota, which is the largest county and the largest judicial district within our state with a population of about 1.25 um, million people. And it would serve about 25% of our overall state cases. And prior to that, I was also a, an assistant county attorney where I specialized in Indian child welfare as it relates to native children in our child welfare system. Um, I'm happy to be here today and we're hoping that you're gonna have a lot of really good questions. We want this to be as interactive as possible for a webinar. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to my, my co-presenter, which is Senator Mary Kunish, uh, who is our very first native Senator within the state of Minnesota. And we're also very proud of her. Mm -hmm. Senator Kunish. Well, Tonka, Judge, thank you very much. And uh, to wash day, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Mary Kunish of the great state of Minnesota, a descendant of the Standing Rock Nation and uh, a proud uh, legislator here in Minnesota. I spent four years in the Minnesota House and just finished my second year in the Minnesota Senate where, um, as Judge McKaig said, I'm the first Native American woman to serve 
in our state uh, Senate. I'm also the author of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force. It is probably the most comprehensive um, task force across the nation and uh, looking at this, this um, pandemic of violence against our native communities. I'm also the author of the permanent office within our state government. And that's the first uh, missing and murdered relatives office in the nation. Um, and we will uh, continue to do the work and look at the recommendations that came out of that task force. Um, I think it's very important to, to be uh, understanding this historic trauma that our, our uh, Native communities have uh, been through for generation after generation. And I'm, I'm very thankful and appreciate this opportunity to share the work that we have done and the work that we will continue to do. Dilamia. Thank you, Senator. And I don't know if we're gonna start with one of the polls. If not, I'm gonna jump right in, but I forgot to ask this question before we started the webinar. So we did have a poll about uh, the different um, work background that people have. So I don't know if we have that poll, if we could put it up. So I'd ask you all to answer the question, if you would take a second, just so we know sort of who's in our audience. It's always amazing to me. I grew up on the reservation where we had shared phone lines, party lines. I don't know if any of you who are listening today know what a party line is, but it's always amazing to me all of the technology that we have now. It's incredible. I had to share a, a phone line with two other neighbors and one of our neighbors was always on the phone with her sister. So we rarely got to use the phone. People look at me now like, what on earth is that with all of our cell phones and everything else? So. Thank you for taking the time to answer the question. It looks like we've got a wide variety of individuals in the room. And so we hope that um, you will all be able to take away something from this. And then again, we also invite your questions. All right, and with that, uh, while the poll is finishing, if we could go to the very first slide, please. And if you're a presenter, you'll just have to minimize the poll yourself. Oh, there you go. Something I learn new every day. All right. So we've entitled this, first of all, as we are not invisible, but that is because we have 574 federally recognized tribal nations in the United States. But I bet that if I asked many of you to name even a half dozen or a dozen of them outside of your state, perhaps, you would be unable to do so. And that's not uncommon. Um, I think it's really challenging for, for people to know uh, how many federally recognized tribal nations we have in this country, as well as what is their role and how are they set up and how do they inter interrelate to its, the surrounding communities. And so when we title this, We Are Not Invisible, it's been sort of a campaign that we have launched across the country to try to help all of our fellow citizens in the country to remember that we are here um, and that we, uh, we have a very important role to continue to play in this country. So 574 recognized tribal nations, that number is ever growing. Many of our tribal nations continue to make application to reassume, reassume their um, federal recognition as perhaps somewhere along the way as a result of history, it was given up. So you may want to watch that number grow as things um, continue to progress and in this country. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So the native population is uh, an issue that I think also affects the missing and murdered. And that is because it is very hard, I think, for the census to actually get a correct number uh, in the 2020 census, there were um, 9.7 million people uh, that were uh, identified as Native or Alaskan, and that can be a combination of another race, and that is up dramatically from the 5.2 million in 2010. Part of the challenge comes from, I think, the reservations and where we are all from, as well as who is actually attempting to access the information. There's been, as you can appreciate, a history of distrust between the federal government and as well as state government, any type of government and native peoples. And so it's been 
a challenge to try to sort of break through that distrust to allow for the government to actually capture data. And that includes uh, how we identify ourselves. And so this number has definitely increased. And I think that is a really good thing. Uh, but it continues to be an issue as to how, what is the an accurate assessment of the native population. My hometown is about 95 people. And I have a daughter who identifies, uh, who is Native American, but she is also Hispanic. And so when you are asked to claim one or the other, it has been, I think, a great frustration for those across Indian country, as well as whether one wants to put that information into a government generated form, first of all. So this is the most up-to-date native populations that, that we have in regards to the census. Um, as to whether it's completely accurate, I leave that to you to decide. I myself think that it is something that we continue to work on. Um, and part of that comes from our own community leaders trying to help us gather this information. Next slide, please. So this has been part of uh, a statement that was given by uh, Ms. Kimberly Heavy Runner Loring before the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. And that is that um, sort of this whole idea of that we are no longer gonna sit quietly and, and sort of take on of these, these issues in isolation, that we are here, that we are going missing and that we are being murdered and that we are going to be vocal about this issue because it is so incredibly important. And we have so many family members who have lost loved ones. I think that if you spoke to uh, native people, you're not gonna find a single person who isn't going to know of someone who has either experienced this through the loss of a loved one or one who's missing um, or who has been touched by this issue in some way. And yet uh, oftentimes we are not considered a group of individuals who are involved or who uh, vote frankly. And sometimes that I think um, is, a, is a loss of power that we have for ourselves and a loss of voice, which is incredibly important. If we could go to the next slide, please. So as part of these presentations, we really want to bring home the fact that these are real individuals. Uh, this is Miss Amber Hopkins. She is from Minneapolis. She was 31 years old and was pregnant, newly pregnant, only about five weeks along. She had been missing for 10 weeks before she was actually found um, in some underbrush along with trash and other debris in a snow pile. And she wasn't found until the snow actually began to melt. And she was a proud member of the Sisseton Wapaton tribe um, in the Dakotas. And as you can see, she's a beautiful young woman, vibrant in um, only 31 years of age, expecting her child. And yet she was thrown away like somebody who didn't matter. And so we utilize some of these photos just so that you have an image in your head that these are real people that we're actually talking about. We can go to the next slide. This is Samantha, her last name was Rios. She was from the state of Washington. She disappeared in 1992 and was not actually found until 2016. And if you can imagine her loved ones having to sit and wait from 1992 until 2016 to learn of what had happened to her. Uh, there, she was in a very violent relationship, unfortunately. Her husband had been a suspect uh, and yet he was never charged. Um, the investigation lingered and there was evidence that she was actually uh, stabbed to death and he became the prime suspect. And as you can see, she's also very young. If we can go to the next slide. This is Rosetta Strong. She is also from Wapato, Washington. Again, 31 years old. She had four children um, and she disappeared in October of 2018. And as of today, she is still missing and has not been found. 
And uh, any of you who have children or nieces or nephews, if you can even think about the fact that you have uh, your mom is been gone for now, well, let's see, coming up on four years um, with no one actually knowing what has happened to her. I think it, it is, uh, goes a long way towards adding to the trauma that so many of our youth have uh, unfortunately are already experiencing. So we're gonna go to the next slide and it is a, uh, it's a video clip that we'd like to show you. It's about six minutes in length. It's death and disappearance in Indian country. Um, we may have to skip over, oh, no, there we are. So please watch. We're not hearing the sound. Back or you call theirs back by Can you hear it now? Ashley! Ashley! Yes, we can hear it. Ashley! In our culture, you, you call your spirit back or you call theirs back by yelling four times. Where is she now? And that's why we're doing what we're doing because we don't know. You know, you have that hope she's alive, but all these rumors you still, this is what it brings us to. Ashley, Ashley is very outgoing. She's friendly. She's so feisty, it's, it's actually cute. Ashley's so funny, she's pretty amazing. So with the police, I, the frustration with them is they, they looked at her as somebody who would just head out. They told us she was old enough that she can go do whatever she wants. She was over the age of 18 and I just feel like she wasn't a priority to them. Gathering data is a challenge. You know, I think that's a challenge uh, in any area of law enforcement, but we have particular issues in Indian country just because we have so many sovereigns and so many governments. I don't, I can't think of it a single person I know, an indigenous person that doesn't have some sort of experience, whether it was a aunt, whether it was a cousin, these are grandma, these are mom. This is a daughter, this is someone who was loved and living, and this is someone who, they were possibly invisible in life, but they don't have to be invisible in death. It becomes a population that you can prey on because no one does anything about it, because there's no deterrence, because there's no enforcement and no prosecution. Going. And everywhere we went, she'd see people and she'd always be telling them, I love you and Jesus loves you. I would go downtown. I start looking at everybody and in my mind, in my mind, I'd be saying, I wonder if you did it. Did you do it? She was frozen to the mountain, her face. I hated everybody. I was on a pity trip, flying me and all this, you know. Think about her all the time. I just figure, I told myself, grandfather needs another angel. So I took her. There was a lady, and she was a white lady, you know. 
and there were so many people looking for her right off the bat. I mean, there were so many. And we couldn't even get not even half of a quarter of who was looking for her to come and help us, to come and help, you know, my family here. If you know something you think you know something, please report it. And help with the searches. They need help. They need help, please. This family was talking about their daughter going to the store 18 years ago and never coming home. That was probably my hardest point was right there. Thinking like, holy crap, is that gonna be us? We need to we need to get everybody involved now. These police need to step up their game and get out there and help us because you know, I don't want my family to have to deal with this every day for that many years. I don't wanna be searching years and years later. I remember this time that I told Ashley, I was like, we have to stick together. It's just me and you here. And I told her that I would never leave her. And if she was going to go anywhere, I'd find her. I was only eight years old when I told Ashley that. And Ashley was five. Thank you. And we also have one more that we're going to ask that you watch and then um, we'll talk about it a little bit. So we can go to the next one. That'd be great. Good afternoon, Chef Patchway. What I'd like everybody to do is please share this out. Share this out. Yeah. We're finishing up just some of the lettering on these posters for the prayer walk so that we can find out what happened to Resenda. She is a mother of four, two sons and two daughters. I hope everybody comes out and joins us today in Wapato. <laughs> so I'm grateful that all of you are here today to support Sissy and Carmen and the entire family of Rosinda. Rosinda Strong's my sister, and I'm not going to stop looking for her, and neither will my family. I'm going to share her picture every day until she's found. I'm going to hang up posters until she's found or until someone feels guilty enough to come forward. It's unbearable even not knowing where she's at. I sit up sometimes laying in my bed, wondering wondering if I should go to the places where she was. But I know they won't give me an answer. So if you guys know something, all it takes is two seconds, pick up the phone and call. You don't have to give your name. I just want my sister. My niece got to live without her mom and her other brothers and sisters. I just want to thank all you people for, for coming, all of you, man. It means a lot to me and my sister. Our sisters can't just go missing or our brothers and nothing happens. That's why we're here today. We want answers. We want justice. We deserve to feel safe and protected. We're not accepting nothing. We're not accepting silence. Colonizers of assimilation, of abuse that our ancestors and our elders went through.
All right, so there's um, pretty heavy stuff there. Uh, there was a couple of questions that were posted that I'd like to try to answer. One is, are there any statistics available on the cases that do end up being solved? And of the ones that were solved, how many are victims of interpersonal violence, trafficking, random violence by strangers? Um, that is one of the key problems is, again, we don't have really good data on any answers to any of those questions. You know, the things that we know is that Native women are experiencing or are being trafficked at a rate that is astonishing. And in fact, um, on the national average has been as high as 40%. We know that one in three Native women are going to experience sexual or physical assault in their lifetime. Uh, we know that a greater number of the women who are being trafficked uh, are in cases that around either around child welfare or are around domestic violence. But as far as the overall numbers, we don't have any of that good data. There has been no um, effort until recently to try to set up or even discuss how to collect data. And part of that, I believe, comes from we have 500, 574 sovereign nations and sometimes I think that people become overwhelmed and therefore um, it's sort of like, it's not our problem. When you look at these pictures, you will note that those, what you're seeing are all native people who are um, either on the march or who are speaking up about the, our sisters and brothers who have gone missing. It is a rare occasion where you will see anyone perhaps non-native uh, being a participant at any great level, I should say, um, not that they're not interested, but sometimes I think people assume that that the tribe is addressing it or that the native people are addressing it or just not knowing what to do or how to help. Um, the other question was, are there any trends that we are aware of? And as far as the only trend that we're aware of is just the high statistics, which is why we're trying to talk about this more so that we can we can have more allies and people who are um, really learning about the issues so that that you too can help speak up because otherwise um, we're just not making any progress in any sort of a meaningful way. And when you look at um, trafficking and indigenous communities, Minnesota, for example, we have our Duluth and that has unfortunately been an area where it is on the harbor uh, where we have a sort of a port, as you will, for where our young women are being taken, as well as the Mall of America, which is another place in Minnesota where many youth have been trafficked, but our native girls at an even higher number. Um, so other than looking at sort of the, um, the history of what has happened to Indian people, um, it's a pattern that is continuing where we sort of hit the top of the range in almost every a negative category, which is really sad. Um, also, when you look at the law enforcement agencies of the, they reported 173 uh, sex trafficking incidents, and this is just in 2017. And that was in only within the state of Minnesota. And of the 173 trafficked victims, 23% of those identified as American Indian, which is an incredibly high number. Um, far too high. And I think there was another question here, or is it in the chat that I saw? All right, so hello to Michelle Henry. It's so great to see that you are on. Michelle and I went to college together. Um, what technology needs could help solve these crimes? Well, for one of the things is that I think there needs to be a lot more federal dollars uh, and partnership with the tribes as far as what technology it is that they would like or that they could would be able to find useful. I think a lot of people, when they can think of federal agencies, you have the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs or the, the police departments that um, perhaps are working on reservation or with reservations. But I can assure you that the resources are very minimal, if any at all. And again, it goes back to building a trust relationship. So if I could wave a magic wand, what I would like is for the federal government to sit down with all of the tribal leaders and to have a meaningful discussion about what it is that the tribes think would be helpful. Oftentimes we have a habit of 
we, uh, when I say we, I'm walking two worlds, uh, the non-native world going to the native world and saying, here's what we think you need, rather than the non-native world going to the native world and saying, what is it that you think that you need that would be most helpful, if that makes sense. If we go to the next slide, please. So looking, um, there is this, uh, 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 there's another sort of natural uh, link and that has been uh, what's been happening with uh, some of the other political issues that you might see, other industries and the negative impact that they have had on this issue of trafficking. If you go to the, um, the, the oil fields in the Dakotas, if you go to where some of the, the pipelines are being built, it is remote areas. And um, oftentimes we are seeing that a large number of our native youth are actually missing in those areas. And it's the impact that industry has had, which is supposedly supposed to be positive, And yet um, it is, has not had a positive impact. And so I'm going to show you a short uh, clip as it relates to the um, the industries within the state of Minnesota and and just what some of our people have to say. So we go to that next clip. As a culture, as a society, as a species, we have tricked ourselves into believing that being extractive and domineering is the way to be. We have to learn how to live in harmony with the natural world and each other. And you have access to wealth to show up with your dollars today too, okay? Okay, good. I'm going to invite Missy Babineau back up to end our day. Woo! Missy Babineau, can I talk to you about a small place called Fort Peck, Montana. Fort Peck has a population of 218 people. They had 48 registered sex offenders living in that area. Fossil fuel infrastructure project came through and that town of a population of 218 went to having 600 registered sex offenders living in their town. That is a tribal community. When you look at the statistics, the men who buy sex, on average, they're uh, middle-class white men and sometimes not who these construction workers are. They get away from their family for extended periods of time. They have an excess in money and time. Because the government and the oppressors don't let us govern ourselves, we can't do anything about this. And that's what you're bringing to us, Tim. Can I get a no line three? No Thank you. So if we can go to the next slide, which is the human um, rights crisis. So one of the questions earlier was the trends that we're seeing. And I mentioned the trend that we know um, that these cases are related to domestic violence, child welfare, and then trafficking. But what we also know is that non-Native men are committing these assaults at a much higher rate than those of um, our Native brothers. Um, we also know it's affecting women and girls of all ages, but what's most concerning, or not most, but which is extremely concerning to me, is that we've got um, murder is the third leading cause of death for our, for our young women between the ages of 10 and 24, which is just alarming. And what's unfortunate is that um, what, I, what I want people to take away from this is that do not, do not be afraid if that's what it is, or um, maybe you feel like you don't have enough knowledge about your native communities, or you're thinking that you might be stepping over. Uh, we need help from non-native people to combat this problem. We need uh, non-native people to care at the same level that we care because, um, and it's not because you, you don't, but it's just not advertised. If you think about the cases where you see on the news of women who have gone missing or who have been murdered, I want you to think about how often you have actually seen 
a native woman's face as you may think, I guess, of a native woman, you might not know, um, but who is shown on the news or where you see a great amount of resources being put into someone looking for a young native woman who's disappeared on a reservation. I challenge you to think of when you might have seen that within your area if you don't live on or near a reservation. And even then, it is sort of deemed as a reservation problem and that it is those who work on or with the reservation who can deal with it and that those who don't are not a part of the problem. Um, it's, it's really quite alarming. And even if you look at the posters of people who are missing, I will only see young native women being a, an inform, information poster being put up if I actually drive onto the reservation and stop at a gas station or someplace on the reservation. If I go to some place outside of the reservation, I don't see those same posters, even though it may be, um, there may be other gas stations that are within the boundaries of the reservation, but perhaps not utilized as much or run by native people. And I don't see those same posters. And I have to ask, and we should all be asking ourselves, why is that? It is a human rights crisis and it is one that deserves the attention of everyone and not just a few. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. And this is just looking again at the statistics which are um, beyond alarming. And we know enough now to, to not be able to, or should not be able to look the other direction. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Kunish who is going to go through uh, looking at this as a four-part crisis. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, uh, Senator, <laughs> not Senator, um, Judge McKay, you um, nailed so many of the intricacies of this kind of uh, uh, community, national, global issue so well. So we're gonna talk next about um, a four part crisis. The first part is the data crisis that um, Judge McKay alluded to. And again, a little bit more on the on reservation or village crisis, then looking at um, urban issues as well as the historical crisis. So that's kind of what we're gonna go through the next in the next couple of minutes. Next slide, please. So we, uh, Judge McKaig alluded to the lack of data and the challenge of any data that is or has been collected. As I was trying to uh, put together this task force, everybody asked me for data because data is what drives, you know, action and dollars. And I couldn't find, you know, real succinct data, um, either, even within our state because our systems don't work together uh, at the federal level, at the state level, even between um, um, uh, commissions and agencies. And then the, um, the ability to share data between the tribes and anybody else in the outside world, there's so much distrust. So that data is very scarce. Uh, nobody or very few people bothered to collect that data over the decades, over the centuries. And so it was very, very minimal and it was messy. It was super messy. Like some states collect some in this manner or that manner in this sort of a database, but not that sort of a database. Um, the misidentification of individuals that were um, found dead or went missing. Um, if they are of two, um, you know, two nationalities, it's oftentimes like the Indian part would be left off. And so it's been very, very messy. The other thing is that um, within the tribal enrollment information and affiliation, uh, tribes, you know, didn't have the kind of technology that we have today. 
And so there was a lot of, you know, handwritten information. I, I mean, like when I go, we've done a lot of genealogical um, research on my family, on, you know, all the different uh, branches of my family. And we can go back into immigration records and birth records and baptismal, you know, all of those things. But the tribes didn't always keep records that, that were helpful. They are also very distrustful of, of governmental agencies. And so there were many, many um, Native folks that did not want to be counted or to have their, their data um, shared or stored anywhere specifically. And that oftentimes goes back to um, boarding schools and forced removal of children from those families. They didn't want the federal government to know that they had children and they didn't want to know their age, them to know their ages because they would come and literally take them from their homes or withhold uh, resources that treaties had promised. So there was that issue. Um, and I think we were seeing that uh, this last time with the, the US census, that there was more cooperation with Native folks um, participating in the census, first of all, because we are not removing them to boarding schools, though we are removing them from by foster care. We'll talk about that later. But they also are starting to realize the federal dollars that are attached to um, their enrollment that their communities have not been receiving for hundreds of years. Um, uh, then we have the National Crime Center that was begun in 2016. At this time, there's 5,612 reports of missing Indigenous women and girls, but we know that to be significantly higher um, through anecdotal evidence. And then we also have, again, um, from 2006, starting in 2016, the U.S. Department of Judges uh, Federal Missing Persons Database which is helpful, but again, it, it, it always depends on who's inputting that data and um, how are they interpreting the information that is provided either through autopsies or family members um, and a, a variety of different things. In there, there's only 116 um, cases logged. So look at the discrepancy just in those two databases. Next, next slide, please. So we're, we'll talk a little bit about on reservation and village crises. Um, again, we're talking about that mistrust and that lack of information and communication between law enforcement, local law enforcement, tribal police departments, um, lack of resources for tribal law enforcement agencies in general, and then the incredible confusion and complicated jurisdictional um, responsibility. Because um, in Minnesota, we are a public law 280, PL 280 state. And not all of the states um, are public law 280 across the nation, and not all of the tribes here in Minnesota um, uh, agreed to be uh, um, policed under Public Law 280. And Public Law 280 basically um, uh, took away the, the responsibility and the rights of tribes to self-police and put in federal um, ramifications and, and, and supposed cooperations. But what that did is it leaves the tribal police um, almost handcuffed to addressing the issues that happens on the reservation. So in essence, anybody could come onto uh, a reservation. They could create a criminal law if it's of a federal offense, such as murder or, or uh, rape or those sort of things. Uh, the tribal police were not able to address that. We had to wait for the federal government and we know how slow the federal government is to act. There's maybe one or two investigators per state. There's often reservations are, you know, in, in uh, isolated obscure places where they were put. And so there was not a lot of attention put into investigating those. So what would happen is if in Minnesota, if tribes wanted to create their own police departments, 
um, the state said, okay, you can go ahead and do that, but you have to work in conjunction and have oversight of county sheriffs. So in essence, they had to abide by the county sheriff's um, jurisdictions. And if there aren't good relations between the county and the reservations, and I, I can think of Mille Lacs where the governor eventually had to um, have a lawsuit against them saying, yes, you do have to participate in this and you do have to hold up your police responsibility. Um, it gets very mirrored and uh, mired in, in miscommunication, lack of any kind of support. And then um, historically, the off-reservation police were not interested in, in um, addressing those that went murdered or went missing on tribal lands. And we, we've heard stories time and time again, even to this day, how families would go to police departments and say, you know, my girl is missing. And they would poo poo them and say, oh, she probably ran away. She's off with her boyfriend. She's probably at a party. Let us know when she shows up. But we didn't have, they don't do those you know, instant kind of searches that we've seen for white girls where helicopters come out and thousands of people are searching the grounds and the media is on it. Those, it's a very different story. And it's a different story for reservations and urban, um, our urban communities, communities because Minnesota has one of the largest urban um, communities of indigenous people. And when that is the case, then it is the responsibility of the municipalities, such as Minneapolis and St. Paul, to address those issues. So we can go on to the next. And then uh, I alluded a little bit to the urban crisis because um, one of the issues that has happened over time is that uh, there was the, reloc the relocation period for our native communities. First, they put us all on reservations, said, you stay out there, you can't come off uh, the reservation. Treaties said that they will, the state, uh, the federal government will provide food, clothing, tools, housing, education. We know that never, they never did that with um, full fidelity. Then this government said, oh my God, we've got this Indian problem. This is costing us too much. And they're just sitting out there. Well, finally, some of the tribes were starting to, you know, um, to thrive where they were. They found ways to build businesses and farm and that sort of thing. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So then they brought them to the cities, the relocation era. They brought them to like Minneapolis and Detroit and Chicago and said, we will provide housing. Again, we will get your kids educated. We will give you every resource necessary to relocate. That didn't happen. So once again, they're disrupted and put into an environment that is very foreign to them and expected to somehow thrive, which made them even more vulnerable, especially in the urban core. And so again, um, women and children and girls were most vulnerable. And when you don't have a place to live, when you don't have a place to sleep, when you don't have food, when you can't take care of your kids, that's when the predators come out of the woodwork. And that's when sex trafficking and other nefarious actions um, come about. There again is that lack of data that creates that false perception that our native women and girls um, um, that live off of the reservation are not impacted. But I know I can tell you time and time again, I know plenty of women that, um, are preyed upon here in the Twin Cities, even if they're in a like success, if they're considered successful, there are plenty of times where they are approached and propositioned in different ways that um, that are unhealthy and illegal. And um, that violence is experienced by um, the losses that they experience, and then those experienced by their extended family and the community on the reservation. Our native folks move back and forth between reservations and, and the urban core. We follow a, a, a seasonal cycle, right? 
we have hunting season, we have fishing season, we have racing season, we have uh, maple, we have sugar bush season where we're tapping um, the, the um, trees. And so a lot of our folks will go back and forth and that also creates sort of a vulnerability because sometimes somebody will go missing perhaps and the family doesn't realize that until it's, it's too late. Um, and then, of course, that psychological, emotional loss of losing a loved one or, or knowing that their loved one was um, just horrendously murdered has that, um, that, that genetic, that epigenetic um, uh, change for generation after generation. And we see that to, to this day, um, how that has affected our Native communities. We can go to the next one. And then the historic crisis, um, you know, um, we talk about the emotional and psychological injury over uh, of the lifespan of an individual as well as the generations. And uh, when what our, our relatives talk about their families, you know, I talked a little bit about our genealogy, but there are plenty of people that can go back generation after generation and name their ancestors and the ones that were murdered or died of violence. And, and to this day, they feel wounded. That is that, 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 you know, that, I don't know how to say it, but that, that burden that we are, that we carry from generation to generation, not wanting to forget our ancestors, yet not quite understanding how we can um, heal because there hasn't been any effort to heal um, time and time again. And I mentioned epigenetics. Uh, there is actual proof that, that those kind of uh, historic traumas uh, and genocide have changed the genetic composition of our native uh, folks as well as other folks of color. And, and we are still dealing with that today. Um, so a lot of the historic trauma response is to avoid our government entities or family and self preservation. And we see this by reluctance to, um, to be vaccinated. We uh, see that by the poor health uh, outcomes that our Indigenous folks, our Native folks have highest, uh, highest rates of diabetes and um, heart disease, um, as well as addiction. Addiction is, you know, been generations of, of efforts to self-medicate, but because of that lack of trust, time and time again, um, our Native folks won't go to, to um, the dentist or to the doctor. And we've seen examples where in the past when they have um, allowed a medical practitioner to participate in their medical health, we see that it makes them even more vulnerable by uh, our women being sterilized, our men being used uh, in experiments without their permission, and then the, the um, sexual abuse and the predators by um, quite a few medical practitioners and others like that. So that, that um, those kind of situations, you know, of course, are going to bring generations of depression, self-destructive self behavior, high rates of suicide. Um, we saw that just a few years ago in the Dakotas where there was just a heartbreaking number of youth that were so desolated and, and felt so desolated and distressed and depressed that uh, we saw the high levels of, of suicide, low self-esteem and anger. Um, I was a teacher for 25 years and I see our, our native kids come into school. Um, maybe they came in, started school late because it was rising season and their family hadn't come down and schools would be upset because they they weren't there for those first two weeks. Now we have to go back and retrain them, reteach them. You know, why can't they just be like everybody else? Um, and so uh, these are the sort of things that, that, that make our women and our girls, and it's not just our women and girls, but it's our men, our boys, and our two-spirit, our LGBTQ community that are so vulnerable. Next slide. And then the historic crisis of poverty, 
Um, our Native American Indians have the highest rate of poverty and um, experience that variety of disparities of health that I spoke of. And um, the last point there is very, very heartbreaking. One of the most alarming is the overrepresentation in and out of home placements for foster care. Uh, that includes child protection, children's mental health, developmental disabilities, and some delinquency foster care placements. Minnesota has the highest number of Native children removed from their families, oftentimes for minimal reasons that white kids or other kids aren't removed, placed into foster care, and they experience the highest rates of being kept in foster care than any other population across the nation. So instead of providing, you know, uh, instead of addressing the issues that might have affected that removal of the child, um, they're just taken away, put into foster care. And um, too often those, those, um, those uh, county workers and maybe judges and lawyers do not understand ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act. So that is not carried out with full authority. And uh, fortunately, Judge McKaig is make, trying to make change and educate uh, our county workers as well as uh, the law profession and the judicial uh, profession around ICWA because we want to preserve those families. Rather than removing those children, what are the resources needed to keep that family intact? So we have to do a 360 approach to those families. And I think we can find um, huge success. And I think uh, you can go to the next slide. And now I am going to turn it back over to Judge McKay to talk about congressional actions. Thank you, Senator. So uh, the Senator just brought up the issue of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And when we look at our United States Congress and what have they done to help address or alleviate issues as it relates to Indian country, there are some things that have been done, but one of them is the Indian Child Welfare Act, federal law passed in 1978. It was an attempt to actually address the historical trauma and what were, um, an inordinate rate of removal of Native children from their families, and for oftentimes for reasons that were acceptable within the Indian community, but were perhaps foreign or unknown to those living outside of the Native community. And many of you have perhaps heard in the news that the Indian Child Welfare Act is essentially under attack. There are two cases that are going to be heard before the United States Supreme Court this session that will greatly have an impact on what happens um, across Indian country. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, because I'm not going to spend all this time on the Indian Child Welfare Act, but I think it is important that we understand it. So it applies to child welfare proceedings where we have children who are not married, they're under the age of 18, and they are either a member of a tribe or they are eligible for membership in a tribe. And the only people who can actually determine membership eligibility is the tribe itself. And the tribe may on occasion change their policies and practice as for who is eligible for membership and who is not. But regardless, they could change their minds a hundred times. Uh, what matters is that it is the tribe and the tribe only who can actually make the determination about who is eligible for membership. If we go to the next slide, please. And what it requires in concept is that the Indian Child Welfare Act's purpose was really for a partnership between tribes, native people, as well as county agencies who are responsible for the welfare of young children. 
And so it requires a heightened level of services where the county is actually making an attempt to ensure that kids do not have to be removed from their home. And frankly, it's good social work practice across the board. I consider the application of the Indian Child Welfare Act sort of the gold standard for social work as it relates to native uh, children and children across the board. But it does have some additional requirements, one of them being heightened level of efforts, not just reasonable efforts aimed at either prevention or return, but it is a active level. It is has an additional party to the proceedings, which are the tribes. Consider them a third appropriate parent ready and able to make decisions on behalf of their children. It also requires what's called qualified expert witness testimony, different than that of what you think of perhaps in a civil lawsuit, or it may be a doctor who's able to speak to a unique injury. This has to go to the cultural needs of the child. And is this unacceptable parenting within that specific tribal community? And if we could go to the next slide. And just to finish on the Indian Child Welfare Act, it will be very interesting um, to watch and see what happens with the United States Supreme Court and whether they strike down the Indian Child Welfare Law, law and say that it's a race-based or whether they uphold the concept of it, which is really this, what I consider to be an extremely important partnership between our tribes and our social service agencies to prevent removal of native children. Um, unfortunately, the Senator is right in that the numbers of Native youth who have been removed and continue to be removed across the country have not really improved. The same with our graduation rates. We're staying at a very low 49% graduation rate, almost ticking every box off um, in a negative way, which is, is not good. If you look at other congressional action, we have you know Hannah's Act of 2017, and that was just to uh, named after a young woman who was murdered uh, and was found there was a day designated as a national day as sort of this awareness for missing and murdered Native women and girls. Uh, there is also the Savannah Act of 2020, which also is supposed to help with the jurisdictional complexities. As mentioned by the Senator, we have federal, state, tribal, local law enforcement all trying to work together. If you think of even uh, foreign countries, perhaps United States trying to work with other countries in gathering uh, information and trying to have a unified front. It's similar to that. Also trying to come up with ways that we can not only increase the collection of data, but how do we share that data? If some of you think about your states, Minnesota is unique in that our court system is all on one system. So if I commit an act in one of our 87 counties, Another county can actually see if I have a pending court proceeding, but that is not the same of our tribal courts. We have 11 tribal courts active within our state. Our tribal courts cannot see what the state is doing and the state cannot see what our tribal courts are doing. And that also runs across the board to our child welfare, our um, jail, any of those things, all of it, it continues on. All right, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, then there was the Senate uh, Committee on Indian Affairs Oversight, which the hearing was in December of 2019. Uh, there was testimony from all of these individuals who were named, but what has resulted in it is, is a far cry from what we need to actually address the issue. So if we go to the next. Uh, the Survive Act, um, which amended the Victims of Crime Act in 1984, and diverts or puts a percentage of the funds to help the tribes uh, assist their survivors of violent crimes on the reservation. Next slide. I'm gonna flip it back over <laughs> to Senator Kunish here. Well, this is uh, very near and dear to me, so I'm excited to um, share the work that we've done here in Minnesota. When I was elected in 2017, um, 16, and my first se uh, session in the House, I was four years in the House, two years in the Senate. Um, 
uh, Canada came out with their preliminary missing and murdered Indigenous women's task force report. And there was a horrendous um, murder, Savannah Graywin LaFontaine in North Dakota that spurred me to create this task force here in Minnesota. And so we were able full bipartisan by cam by uh, body support. So in the Senate, the House, Rep uh, Republicans, uh, Democrats all supported this task force, and it was the first in the nation like it. And we uh, were tasked with uh, looking at the systematic causes behind the violence of Indigenous women and girls. We needed to look at the methods for tracking and collecting data, as we've been talking about. We wanted to examine the policies, the practices, and how things were being investigated and prosecuted um, in crimes of gender violence, and then measures uh, measures to address and reduce that violence. Because it's not it wasn't just that we wanted to find out or prove that it was really happening. Our um, our end of the game is how can we stop this? How can we make this not happen anymore to any more of our folks, as well as the general public? And then um, we wanted to make sure that there were resources there for the families, the survivors um, themselves of, of, of uh, violence, and um, for those families and how we could help the communities uh, heal. And I have to tell you that the, the legislation was written by our Native American communities. I asked everyone I could think of to take a look to help you know, write this piece of legislation, give me feedback, review it, tell me who you want on this task force. And so this was really truly a grassroots um, piece of legislation that we passed. Next slide. As I said, um, we were tasked with examining the systemic causes behind the, uh, behind the violence, and then also to provide suggestions or ideas on how to um, appropriately develop methods uh, for tracking and collecting that data. And it, it's no good if we put it into a report and then put that report on the shelf. So we made sure that there were um, stipulations to report on the policy and the institutions, such as policing and child welfare, the coroner's practice and other pr um, practices that impact that violence against Indigenous women and girls and the investigation. And I should also say that when I was um, putting this legislation together and we identified the different agencies and um, commissioners that we would like to have participate, I went to each and every one of them and asked them, explained what I was doing, would they support this legislation? Because we didn't want any, let's say, hostile or uncooperative members on the on the task force, every single one of them said absolutely without hesitation. And not a one of them um, charged a fee. You know how it is in the state government, there's a, a fiscal note to have folks participate from state governments. They waived that on all of them. They wanted this to happen so badly. And so um, again, those measures to help the victims and their families. Next. This is um, just a small list of the folks that were on that task force. We wanted to make sure that we had a broad um, group of uh, state agencies and commissioners. And then we absolutely wanted to make sure that there were community organizations that were able to um, guide this whole process, uh, tell their stories, take it back to the community and ask, you know, how would you like, again, how would you like us to, to do this work? Uh, we had two state representatives, so two uh, folks from the House and two from the Senate, one Republican, one Democrat, and um, the, their participation was very valuable. Next slide. This is, and then we had to make, we wanted to make sure that there was a representative from every single one of the tribes, and there was. And then, as I said, we um, asked community members to participate. And so our, our vision was to go out into the community around the state, 
hold listening sessions when we had our task force meetings. Unfortunately, uh, the pandemic interrupted that, but we made sure there was a website, there was a, a phone line, folks could call in and leave messages and tell their story. Um, they could contact any one of us on the task force. We made sure that that was uh, viable. And then um, one of our members, Chris Stark, was uh, actually uh, trafficked herself. She was a survivor and a native woman that, that um, semi-autobiographical in her book, Carnival Lights to, uh, told us about that. But those are the really important voices uh, that, that move this task force. Next slide. And then what we did, we held those in-person uh, meetings. We um, included expert presenters and made sure that there was always opportunities for public comments during the sessions, our task force sessions. We did extensive literature review of interviews with 32 experts. And we reviewed whatever data that we could. Um, we looked at uh, data with the child welfare, the DHS, with the uh, death and human trafficking. And I should tell you, the coroner actually asked to be on this because he had some really, really valuable suggestions. And then we worked with the BCA as well to um, really go through those records of missing persons and crimes committed to Indigenous people or possibly Indigenous people. Next slide. And then we found, you know, we, we heard the stories and it traces right back to colonialism and the historic trauma um, and the genocide against our native communities. Racism certainly exists to this day. Sexism and sexual object, objectification of indigenous women and girls. I mean, just Google, you know, Indian Pocahontas costume or, or you know, you look at the mascots that were used for years and years. Um, and we found that the system absolutely does not have adequate culturally responsive healing resources for our communities in any way, shape or form and that the systemic factors, it was not bad lifestyle choices, like, well, you were out on the street after dark, or you were in a bar, or you did this, or you didn't do that. It's not that that caused the violence against the women. It's poverty, lack of housing, lack of prevention and healing, involvement in the child welfare system and the criminal justice system. Again, our Native women, have the highest instances of incarceration of any other population here in Minnesota. And then of course, the domestic violence part of it. And as Judge McKeg uh, mentioned earlier, um, in one of the studies that we, uh, we read, um, oh gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue, that uh, research showed that, um, that it's like 95% of the uh, perpetrators of violence, domestic violence were not native people, not native men, but um, other, other folks as well. Next slide. I know we're running out of time. I think we could talk about this all afternoon for sure. And so our ongoing work is um, we created that first uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Office. It's a permanent office in our state government. It's funded. Juliet Rudy is our executive director. She is working on hiring three more staff members to implement action plans. And then um, the Minnesota Department of Health is working on um, changing how they do autopsies and including psychological autopsies where family members can um, clue in on, on the, the death when, when it's when it's decided that it's suicide and family members say no way, no way in the world that it was. Um, and then those ongoing efforts to raise awareness of the injustice. And you can go on and then there's social media. You know, uh, the media has not lived up to the level of um, addressing this issue or making it, um, making uh, this issue uh, uh, noticeable or in the TV, the radio and that sort of thing. So when after um, 
uh, Savannah LaFontaine Graywin went missing, um, Senator Heidi Heidkamp uh, launched the Not Invisible campaign. And it was uh, to address the violence experienced by our Native women and to increase that awareness. And then um, uh, eventually uh, folks started to catch on and they were able to submit a photo of themselves with a sign displaying that hashtag Not Invisible. And it went viral like you can't even believe. And so this, um, this site that you can go to now, the Not Invisible site, has many, many, many new pieces of information and data, as well as the names. And this is sort of that grassroots effort that uh, nobody else had done before. And I'm, I'm telling you that the names and the stories just came out of everywhere. And um, it really began this movement. When you think about it, it's only been six years, seven years that we've been able to do this work and it's, it's moving so very quickly. Next slide. And then um, this is the Red Dress Project. It was launched by Jamie Black, who is a Manitoba-based artist. Um, and Judge McKegg and I participated in this art exhibit through the University of St. Catharines, where we had uh, red dresses donated. The color red is um, said to be the only color that our um, ancestors see in the afterlife. And so these red dresses represent uh, family members and were, many of them were donated by family members and others who lost um, um, a, a loved one. And it's an expression of grief and feeling of connectedness to the missing and murdered women. And so this um, art installation is moving across the nation, but you might be anywhere and see a red dress somewhere and recognize it as this um, MMIW, MMIR movement. Next slide. And I believe, um, okay. Judge McKay, are you taking it from here or am I continuing? Sure, no, I can take it from here. Okay. So this is um, the, the close. I'm gonna go relatively quickly, but it is, what do you leave here with? What are things that you can do? How can you partner? And to our judges out there, how can you help sort of lead a change in this so that things improve? One of them is being vocal that we need the MMIW, Missing and, Min Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Database. It, it is incredibly important. We all know who work in government, nothing happens if you don't have the data. So it is incredibly important. If you do not have one in your area, advocate for it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. What else can you do? Make legislation. Uh, if we didn't have Senator Kunish, sadly, I don't think we would have had this legislation within the state of Minnesota, which is unfortunate that it takes someone who is native to actually um, push forward this legislation. But if you don't have something like this within your jurisdiction, ask the why not and get a hold of your legislators and ask them to sponsor something. Next slide. The personal approach. Learn about who is within your state. What are your local programs? Uh, who are your tribal partners? Um, amplify Native voices by helping them actually have a platform. Talk to your friends and families. Get rid of the myths. Acknowledge the land that you reside on and what uh, who originally inhabited that land. And not just by reading a statement of this land was we acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Dakota people, et cetera, because that's very popular right now. It seems to be very chic, but do something. We wanna see concrete action that you can take within your area. Next slide, please. Study, learn about it. What are the political approaches that have worked? 
um, the campaign, the social media campaigns, I will tell you that the Red Dress Project, we had a very large group of people who came out from the local community to learn what MMIW was because of the visual red dresses they could see on the campus. And we had a large number of Native people as well as non-Native people who came together and spent uh, two separate half days learning about it and then actually acknowledging um, and recognizing and remembering those who have died, especially by those who actually offered up a red dress. Just that visual, I think, was very moving for many people, and we gathered a whole bunch of new partners. Next slide, please. We can go to the next one. Building trust. We've talked about this. It is incredibly important. Um, go to the next slide. These are some very simple things that you can do within your businesses. One of the things that we had done was when we went out to the community, we said, what would you like? They said, for one thing, we don't feel represented when we come to your courtrooms. We would like to be able to use our medicine and be able to smudge, which is a cleansing process to put ourselves in a good way before or after something that might be traumatic or um, just to help us focus. And if you can imagine anything that has to do with smoke, we were able to actually get it through the bureaucracy of our court system and allow for individuals who want to be able to use their medicine when they come to court to be able to do so and not um, get in trouble, which would have been the past. You would have set off the fire alarms. Next slide, please. Partnering with our tribes, they presented the tribal flags to our court system and our courts in many of the courthouses now actually host the tribal flags that are there. So if you come from one of your tribal nations within the state, you will see your tribal flag proudly displayed within and alongside the United States flag, as well as our Minnesota flag. Next slide, please. Our veterans came and actually did an educational process. We had the drums within the courtroom. As you can see, there was a celebration and an acknowledgement of tribal or tribal nations within our state, uh, as well as the putting up of the flags. Next slide. Many states have a tribal state court forum where your state court judges can talk with your, uh, your tribal court judges and host ongoing conversation about what do we have with the work in common? How can we work together? How can we collaborate? If you do not have that within your state, ask why not. Next slide, please. Putting up the language. Uh, I was out of town. I happened to see Boujou on a grocery store door. I thought that was amazing. I will say that I felt immediately welcome. We have now done this with our boards within our government center. So those who come, we have it in both uh, Dakota as well as Ojibwe, as well as our other languages, which is something you can do no matter what your business is. Next slide, please. This was just some local artwork that was placed within our courtrooms. Next slide. And this is, I put this up here because I think it is incredibly, incredibly important to not only amplify, but support native leaders within across all of your um, different areas within your state. It is only by the way of having several individuals who have gotten into positions of authority, policymaking and power, where I think we've actually made some strides uh, towards acknowledging and recognizing many of these issues that relate to Indian country. Um, and so if, you know of individuals who might be really good in leadership positions, support them, seek them out um, and help them find their voice. And if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to play something positive for you all. Um, we can skip that, but I always say, if you, make the, if you make the local tribal paper, you know you're doing good. But I wanted to play something positive. I think this is an incredible, strong piece. I hope that you have all been able to learn something from us. We do welcome questions if there is any time left, there might not be, but if we could hit this one, I would really appreciate it. One morning I woke up and I heard my brother crying. He was screaming so loud, you thought someone was dying. Mom, Dad, he screamed, but there was no use trying. They weren't around. 
I ran outside and saw he'd had a pretty bad crash. His bike was in the ditch, down his arm a bloody gash. He looked so pitiful just sitting there in the dirt amongst the trash crying, I want mom and dad. I picked him up and started running toward my uncles up the way. It started raining and got real dark, he could barely tell it was day. My brother cried and asked, sister, where's mom? I didn't know what to say when the truth is, I don't know. When my uncle saw us coming, he ran into the yard. He took my brother from me and he held him in his arms. When he saw my face, I could tell, I could tell he was alarmed. And he said, what happened, did you fall too? Uncle, I'm so tired, so tired of wondering why. Why do they drink? Why do they do drugs? Why do they leave us? Why? He said, sister, it's hard to explain. And I said, uncle, try. And then he told this story. Once this land was teepees as far as you can see. The water was clean, the land pristine. We were where we were meant to be. Then strangers came across the sea and brought with them their disease. Our people cried and prayed and sang, but it brought them to their knees. Imagine that your family, and most of all your tribe, what if most of everyone you love suddenly got sick and died, and before you even had a chance to bury them and mourn, the strangers came and took away the land where you were born, and you wondered if your parents even cared as they stole you and your brother away, or if they'd been so beaten down they had nothing left to say. And then at school, they cut your hair and beat you if you spoke. The language that Creator gave our people when Earth awoke. Sister, I'm not trying to tell you that your mom and dad are okay, or that they are not responsible for the choices that they've made. But you see this bloody wound on your little brother's arm. If we don't clean it, it won't heal and it'll do all kinds of harm. Those deep wounds of our ancestors still bleed within our hearts. When we remember all they've done, that's where the healing starts. So every morning when you wake, you pray this prayer out loud. Creator, help me live in a way that would make my ancestors proud. We will rise up from the darkness. Don't you forget this. You can be anything you want to be. We will overcome the pain. Just work hard. Never give up. Perseverance is the key. family tree so hold your head up high and know that darkness.
us. Little brother, we will overcome the pain. Remember, warrior spirits live within us. We shall remain. I'll turn it back over to the organizers. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm trying to see, I saw there was, we have, oh, we're actually ready to close. So um, we please fill out the evaluation. Thank you for joining us today. I can't thank you enough, um, Justice McKeague and, and Senator Kunish for for all the presentation, it was really um, very informative and powerful. Um, we will make this link available to everyone um, that registered along with the materials provided so that um, you can share them with other people in your community and in your work um, and hopefully uh, galvanize people to join in this very important effort. Any last words, uh, Senator or Justice? No, we just thank you all for taking the time to listen to us and allowing us to present the information. We really appreciate all your partnership and efforts. So, miigwech. Pilamia, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, any of you who are judges or no judges that might be interested in joining the National Judicial Network, we will send you the link um, to join and please share it widely along with this webinar. Thank you very much. And thank you to NCJ, FCJ, and Mary Kate for all your work hosting us. And this was a valiant effort with all the videos and everything. So thank you so much. My Have a good pleasure. Day.